Welcome to the, uh, the launch of the Clinical Practice Guidelines for ADHD. My name is Daniel, Daniel Fang. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist that works largely with kids, and uh, I'm really privileged to be able to, to uh, work together with a, a very multidisciplinary team in doing this uh, over, as I was reflecting just now, the last three years. Actually, when we proposed these guidelines, and these, these are quite unique in the sense that these guidelines were actually um, uh, proposed by the, the, the professionals. Um, usually in guidelines uh, formation, um, there's two ways. One is that the Ministry of Health thinks that it's important because it's a, very, uh, it's a condition that's widely prevalent. A lot of doctors see it and, uh, and they, they want a guideline to inform practice. But in the case of ADHD, um, it was really from uh, a team of us feeling that it's a very important area. Not many doctors are quite aware of the impact. And we wanted to be able to provide a set of guidelines and, and uh, to inform practice. So this is how it started. In 20, I think I went back to my old files. And in 2010, we started writing this little uh, note to uh, the academy. And I think only in 2011 that we started the whole process. And then um, it took us almost three years. But in a way, I'm happy and proud that we are able to come up with this and we'll be sharing this with you today. Um, I'm told I have uh, 30 minutes now. This is my usual, um, just uh, some financial disclosures in case, um, you know, because a lot of the guidelines in, in, in medicine are around drugs. We've uh, taken a slightly different slant in this set of guidelines, and I explained that to you. Um, and, and of course, uh, we try not to be totally influenced by the um, pharmaceutical industry as much as we can. Now, what is ADHD? Um, well, you know, uh, I, uh, I didn't used to be an animal lover, but um, of late, you know, maybe as the children grow up, uh, I suddenly think that animals are not too bad to have around. And we have, uh, we have a couple of cats at home, uh, three in particular. And, you know, um, being a child uh, psychiatric uh, uh, sort of practitioner, you know, we see a lot of autistic children. And I think this book is correct. You know, when he says all cats have Asperger's syndrome, uh, because if you know cats, you know, you can talk to them, they don't look at you, and they come to you, they think of you as their pet rather than the other way around, right? <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> the good corollary to this is that uh, all dogs, of course, have ADHD. Uh, if you have a dog, you will know this, okay? Especially if you have a pup, a young dog. They never stop, you know? I visited homes with dogs. It doesn't matter if they don't know you, they may bark at you, but sometimes they just like to run around. They, they actually don't actually run around you. They sometimes run around themselves when you, you appear because they're excited. So this is interesting. The classification uh, of ADHD has changed somewhat over the years. When it first came out, it was, a, um, it was um, first thought of, and it, it was a pediatrician that actually first described it. They thought it was a, almost like a morally... Um, a child with no moral conscience, bad children. Uh, of course, today we have many iterations of various classification system. I'm sharing with you the DSM-5 because that's something that psychiatrists and, and, and psychologists use quite a fair bit. Now, ADHD moved away from disruptive behavior disorders where that association with badness was there to now, in this latest iteration of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the American Psychiatric Association's classification system under neurodevelopmental disorders. In fact, in the same category as autism spectrum disorders. So uh, that's something new and something to be aware of. Okay? So in the past, it used to be on the right-hand side of this classification. Today, it is now seen more as a developmental problem that involves the brain. So in the new uh, DSM-5, uh, the guidelines when we first started working on it, we were still in DSM-4, text revision version. Okay? And uh, of course, today, DSM-5 was uh, um, um, released last year. Uh, just to keep you uh, uh, sort of aware, there's, there's no really no change in the criteria, the number of symptoms uh, required and the specifiers. The, the differences really is uh, they have added some illustrations if you read the, the diagnostic criteria. And the, the few things that is different is for older individuals, that means teenagers and adults, uh, they've allowed a more flexible uh, way of looking at it. Because in the past, they said that um, you, know, you, you can only diagnose it before the age of uh, uh, um, seven. Is it? Uh, and um, um, sometimes for adults, they cannot, you know, you, they can't remember before the age, of, before I went to school, you know, it's hard for them to tell that story. So, um, 
this is the change. And this change doesn't really affect, uh, uh, affect this gui guideline because this guideline is really targeted at uh, children, the youth and uh, the children and adolescents. For the adults, again, they say that um, you don't need six out of nine criteria in the, um, uh, uh, um, you only need about five. So that's, that's the difference. Um, okay, this is just to show you that actually uh, in field trials for the DSM, um, for ADHD at least, it's pretty uh, reliable and various people using um, the criteria were able to make diagnosis and had fair agreement across um, you know, various uh, doctors. So it's, it's not as uh, hard to make as say anxiety disorders where sometimes doctors can't quite agree. So DSM criteria for ADHD alongside ASD is fairly clear. All right, this is just to show you that. So how would you um, look at ADHD? Well, it's really a behavior problem. Um, I like to think of five things, make it easy for everyone to think about whenever you look at disorders. And for ADHD, it's no difference. You look at intensity and severity of symptoms, its pervasiveness, how um, widespread it is across more than one situation, preferably. If a child is hyperactive only in your clinic, that may be just your clinic. Maybe it's a very interesting place. So if the child is active, they should be active across multiple situations. It should be persistent because um, if you uh, have a child that comes to the clinic and you give them a Coca-Cola or some sweet high sugar drink, it's very likely that by the time they get into your room, they will be moving about. It's normal, all right? And we, uh, so the persistence of the symptoms across time is important. Then it must have some sense of appropriateness. If your room is very interesting, lots of toys and stuff, uh, are you surprised if the child, uh, in, in the present context, because many of our children today are kind of given a lot of freedoms by um, adult caregivers to explore. Then of course, the final one is about functioning. Is the child able to function in spite of their behavior? So a hyperactive child, if they don't really disrupt people themselves or others, then is it a disorder? So it's important. Um, the criteria, uh, and uh, you know, in, in the guidelines, we don't actually put it there largely because of copyright issues with um, the DSM. You can, you can Google it on the uh, website. I think they talk about symptoms in terms of hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive. So each of those hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive, they have about nine symptoms. If they fulfill the criteria, that means the severity um, issue is kind of met. Six uh, out of nine symptoms, or for those above 17, five out of nine symptoms. Uh, more than one situation I mentioned, and before the age of seven uh, for children, and for adults, maybe before the age of 12. Not explained by some other disorder. Uh, so that's important because um, you need to understand there are many other situations that can cause a person to be active and uh, disturbing, not just ADHD. And then, of course, if that, it, it, does it impair functioning? Okay, this is just a sort of a, give you an idea of the differences between the ICD and the DSM, both the four and the five. Those of you who are interested in the slides, I, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, we'll, we'll get AM to, to do this. Um, just, just to take note of the fact that in the international classification of disorders, which in Singapore we actually do uh, use for administrative purposes, ADHD is not um, the terminology that's used. It's hyperkinetic disorder, which probably is a more narrow group of disorders within the ADHD spectrum. That means they, are, they must be very active and they must be very inattentive because in DSM, they allow for that you know, um, variation, some more inattentive, some more active, uh, so ICD is a little bit more um, defined to the very severe multiple domain kind of uh, conditions. What about the causes of ADHD? Um, we don't actually know. <laughs> okay? The literature and the uh, huge amount of science that's gone into it has not proven one thing from another. People have looked at different things. You know this is the brain of a famous uh, cartoon character called Homer Simpson which may be not so famous nowadays. Maybe you have to change. <laughs> um, and as you can see, it could be genetic factors, it could be environmental risk, or it could be 
toxins and injury and infection to the brain. Uh, what's important about behavior is that no child behaves without something going on in the brain. So it starts with some input through the sense, senses, and then various aspects of the brain is activated. Whether it's memory, whether it's attention, whether it's the emotions, whether it's the, um, what we call executive planning functions of the brain. In ADHD, probably the most um, uh, obvious uh, upfront uh, areas of the brain that might, uh, might be affected actually is in terms of the, the way they socialize um, and also in the executive function, functioning. Um, there's some overlap, obviously, in some of the symptoms of ADHD with autism. So in DSM-5, they've allowed for, for people to have both conditions, whereas in DSM-4, they've said, you either make a decision, this is ADHD or this is autism. All right? So this is uh, probably based on um, some of this understanding of the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of the brain. The output, of course, is behavior. Now, of course, um, how do we understand how the brain works? We could use imaging. Um, but today there's, there's a lot of interest on uh, sort of understanding the electrical activity of the brain. And um, there's in fact now a pat uh, patented FDA device which says that they can train uh, the brain towards an uh, electrical pattern that is more attentive. Now this of course is theoretical. Um, it's still not proven. I think it's not. Um, and so in our, our guidelines we actually say that this is not recommended as um, something that you use alone. But it's something to think about. So neurofeedback uh, training to uh, train the brain towards an electrical activity that's consistent with ADHD. Uh, I mean, with um, better attention. So they think that ADHD brains aren't um, having the right electrical activity. With training, you could get, get it in the, in, in the right way. That means getting the, the, the brain waves to, to uh, configure. Okay? And that's, that's the concept of feedback. So that's something to think about. But again, not proven. There's, of course, imaging that suggests this is a very old imaging um, study that uh, using PET scan, looking at adults with ADHD and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and those without control subjects. There are changes. We don't know why or how. We're not sure. There's some theoretical basis. Uh, it's, uh, as I've said earlier to some of my colleagues in, uh, just now, it's sometimes hard to study this group of people. They're, they're kind of fidgety, and you use functional imaging techniques, you know it takes time. So that, that gives you a very skewed cohort that actually gets to be studied. So it's hard to study this. There's also been studies looking longitudinally across the development of the brain. And it doesn't mean that the brain is the same all the time. We change our children's brains in one simple process. It's called education. We send them to school and their brains change. All right? And so therefore, it's a dynamic process. The requirements for attention, the ability to study, and so forth. It's not so straightforward. So it's not easy to understand. The other thing about ADHD is that there is um, association with intelligence and learning. So this slide is just to remind me to talk a little bit about the, you know, uh, the different aspects of intelligence. This is just a simple concept of intelligence. It just says that, well, you know, in, in, a, in a developing brain, there is fluid intelligence, which is um, the novel problem-solving skills. A lot of this is actually um, uh, um, probably inherited, and you can't change very much. You can, of course, teach children to solve problems in a novel way. And obviously, in Singapore, we've done that quite well because we, our kids perform very well on the PISA and all these other tests that test this. Um, does it mean that they're smarter? So I'm not sure. But the, the more likely environmental intelligence that gets changed actually is crystallized intelligence, which is accumulated experience from going to school, having a good environment. So all of you, I'm sure, how many of you have children? Yeah, many, right? So those of you... Uh, Presumably, you are doctors and, and you are well-educated. Your children will have that good environment to begin with. So they have good crystallized intelligence because you provide them a good environment. Now, in ADHD, um, the thing that gets affected probably is the two things down there, working memory and processing speed, which is that efficiency bit. You know, uh, you may have good novel problem-solving skills, but you take two hours to do that. That's not very useful because you want to be able to do it fast. And some of the children have problems with that. They, they don't process information quickly enough. 
Um, they also have problems with what we call their working memory. That means the ability to keep information in little short packets for them to work on. It's what you, I suppose, traditionally in school, you say your mental sums, you know? Can you do your mental sums? How many numbers can you remember? Or if you are a young man and you say, okay, this girl has just given me her phone number. Okay, I've got to memorize it because I've got no paper. That's your working memory. All right, if you've got good working memory, great. Today, of course, that's circumvented. We have many devices that help us to cover our short-term working memory problems. We keep them on, uh, on our, our side. But, but children with ADHD, they have problems with that. They have a very short working memory. Alongside, and I put that at the top really, is uh, children with ADHD have a strong association with phonological deficits uh, associated with dyslexia or reading problems. So that's the, the one thing that, so when you look at academic performance, they, some of them, 20, 30% may have some learning related difficulties. The others have problems with their working memory and maybe in their processing speed. They're not very efficient in the way they solve problems. Language wise, they usually would not have problems, but they can if they have autism, right? So that's the other piece of this. Okay, so what are the areas of concern in the current knowledge about ADHD? Um, I think that um, I, I put it in three, uh, a recluse, <laughs> which less and less so. I think today people are willing to say, I've got ADHD, all right? They're less likely to isolate or not tell anyone about it. Um, and later you'll hear from uh, Bella who will talk about, you know, advocacy from the parents and, and from a uh, support group on how they try to. But I mean, Michael Phelps, right? He... He's known to have ADHD, he's on treatment. Maybe his stimulant medication makes him swim really fast. We don't know. <laughs> is it an excuse? That's another concern. Okay, this, this is a recent newspaper article um, on uh, um, someone who had a had diagnosis of ADHD and uh, was not given jail but probation. Um, sometimes we worry about that because there is that possibility. Uh, th this is a symptom-based diagnosis, you can say. You know, I can tell you, oh, well, you know, I can't concentrate very well. I get distracted easily. If people walk in the room, I have to start again <laughs> as I talk and so forth. So could I have ADHD, doctor? And, and it's hard to tell. It's also liable to abuse um, uh, because um, stimulant drugs are used as uh, potential, at least. They have the potential to become, um, they have a black market price. There are young people who, buy, who get the medication, they sell to their friends for a, a quick buck. And people have used stimulant medications to, um, to enhance performance. They're called like neuroenhancers. If you and I take methylphenidate, which is current stimulant uh, medication that's available, you probably have some improvement in your ability to stay awake or <laughs> in a dreamy afternoon like now. Um, and that's that possibility. All right, because it's a stimulant, although it's a mild stimulant. The, the effects of stimulants on, on, uh, on children with ADHD is much more dramatic, okay, so that you have to be aware of that. So, in fact, in America, they did a little poll. They, they found that one-third of doctors actually felt that, you know, um, they're not quite sure whether the, the people coming, these are adults, coming to get their stimulant medications were, in fact, faking it, all right? So that's something to be aware of as doctors. You, you've got to, to be aware when you, you make that diagnosis. So let's go back to the principles. I mean, my, my goal today is really to tell you uh, why the need for a CPG. Well, this is a definition of a guideline. It aims to streamline processes according to a set routine or, so, uh, or sound practice. For the Ministry of Health, I've tried to crystallize their long write-up. <laughs> uh, and I think it's only about this, you know, improving clinical practice. It wants us to have a standard so that our practice uh, is based on good evidence. All right, so, um, so these were the things that I had to um, put up in order to get the CPG um, true. So I thought I'd, I should cover each one of them individually. Is ADHD a public health issue? Well, if you believe in the burden of disease study here in Singapore, this was done by the ministry, um, for age 0 to 14, it's the third highest contributor to burden of disease, right? So it is important in the young, okay? This, of course, is, um, I, we haven't had a publication of the latest 2010 uh, burden, disease burden study. I suspect that's not much different. Um, and of course, number one is autism spectrum disorders. So we have a CPG for autism spectrum disorders. So I suppose, naturally, 
uh, we should have one on ADHD. I believe we have one on asthma as well. So all the high burden diseases should have a clinical practice guideline because it's a public health issue. This is a very recent uh, paper that just came out uh, in the International Journal of Epidemiology that look at prevalence. Is ADHD a high prevalence condition? Well, this is studies done all over the world. They did a meta-analysis, quite a large number, I think um, more than uh, 130 studies. And um, the prevalence is hovering between five, you know, uh, five to six or seven percent of the population. Now, that's not the most prevalent condition in childhood mental health disorders. That actually belongs to probably the emotional disorders group. But they, uh, ADHD can be quite disruptive because it's high burden. So with a prevalence of 5%, it's still pretty high. All right? uh, if you see 100 children, you're likely to have five of them with ADHD. All right? If you have an unbiased and uh, normal distribution of patients. Um, the other thing about ADHD is it's highly heritable. Okay? It's in fact, amongst all the psychiatric disorders, the most heritable even more, the heritability is even higher. This is, a, a, again, a meta-analysis of five, uh, I think five common conditions in psychiatry using a, um, a gene study that was done uh, by a large uh, collaborative genomic group, an international group. And it is much more heritable than um, uh, many of the other conditions which we think is heritable, schizophrenia being one of them. So ADHD is a public health issue. Is there variations in practice? Well, this is, of course, our famous elephant metaphor. Um, there is variation largely because um, knowledge base on this is still, you know, I mean, it's not well communicated. Um, many of you are here because you are interested in knowing about ADHD or you're interested to know what's the latest. So some practitioners will tell you it's about behavior. We need to discipline and modify the behavior of the child. Some practitioners will tell you it's about training the parents. Some is about learning. And it depends on where you're looking at. If you're a teacher or um, an educationist, that's where you'd see it. If you're a social worker, you might think, well, the parents aren't managing the child very well. If you're a psychologist, you might say, well, it's a behavioral learned response. We can teach you to change. And if you're a doctor, you know, <laughs> there's a tendency for us to use medications. But we are only seeing parts of the whole picture. And uh, of course, in the West, this has gone to the extent that, um, you know, the uh, questions are being asked of over-medicating kids. Actually, in Singapore, we are quite all right. We tend to be quite conservative, I think, in terms of medicating par uh, kids, <laughs> medicating parents as well, I think, for some time, uh, uh, medicating kids. And, uh, but but we are, we're moving along because as a, as if you're a busy doctor, it's much easier to give medications than to do these other things. Um, this, this, for example, is an exam. Uh, well, it's interesting because people think that they're over-medicating. This is an um, um, American psychiatrist who said, actually, but if you look at the data, it's not true. A lot of the times, of course, the doctor may prescribe the medication. Parents just don't give it to the kids or kids don't take it. Don't forget about that. So you can say, okay, kid, you take this medicine, it will help your child because he's got ADHD. They go home and they say, I don't believe this lokun. And they will take the medicine, they will throw it away, or worse still, they'll sell it to their friends, right? <laughs> so be careful of that. But the truth is that it seems like in the reality, um, kids aren't all taking medications as well. Um, is there good evidence of effective practice? Certainly there is, but mostly from the West. Okay, these, these are two guidelines from the um, Pediatrics and uh, the, Amer uh, the American Ac uh, Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry, and they have practice parameters which you can look at. We don't have uh, one for Singapore, and uh, certainly uh, these practice parameters and guidelines don't address some of the local issues, which was the, uh, really the intent of what we're trying to do. Um, this, the first paper is actually a, a very recent publication from the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, which shows how ADHD is important. It's just actually a, a clinical um, a vignette plus some information about the practice of ADHD because ADHD is a common problem. Okay, so the aims of our guidelines um, really is trying to provide you with a, uh, a, 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 a way to understand the assessment uh, towards diagnosis of ADHD and a treatment, developing a treatment plan. 
look at the evidence for non-pharmacological uh, treatments. And in our guidelines, we've especially put it right up front because that should be your first part of call, discussing that with parents and teachers. Then the evidence for medication use, okay? In Singapore in particular, so we talk more specifically about what's available. The target groups are people who come into contact with children and adolescents below the age of 18. So extension to adults, take some care. There is some literature now that is coming out. Um, we don't have guidelines on that. You can try the um, international guidelines. Uh, but if an adult comes to you with, um, with a concern of ADHD, it's likely that it's best that unless they've already been on treatment since young and have been referred to you for continuing care, you might want to get a specialist to have a look. Um, the work group was appointed by the Academy of Medicine Singapore and comprised psychiatrists, pediatricians, educational psychologists, a social, uh, medical social worker, a pharmacist, an advanced practice nurse, and a parent representative. So um, it's, the list is in your, your books. You can have a look at it. Or if you are more, um, uh, if you like to use your iPad, you can download it and read it off your iPad as well. I, I put Spark here because, um, you know, I think we are very privileged to have uh, a parent support group, which Bella is uh, going to talk later. Um, and Spark stands for the Society for the Promotion of ADHD Research and Knowledge. So this is, a, this is important to us. When we, we as doctors, um, and most of you are doctors, when we treat patients, I think it's, it's changing this, uh, the need to uh, engage families and the parent support group is very helpful. So if you do see cases of ADHD, you can refer to them. In fact, they're forming support group also for adolescents and adults, right? Um, and th there's, there's interest in this area. So there's, there's a place for you to send your patients to for the long talks that they need to manage the illness. So I thought it's important to highlight this. Um, some acknowledgements, um, and that's my duty to the next two minutes anyway. <laughs> um, people who have helped us in developing, who's gone uh, from various parts of the world, including someone from Malaysia. Um, um, our editors, uh, as well as the Ministry of Health team, and I acknowledge them for really making this a long, arduous, but not so painful journey. <laughs> Some of the people who taught us, Dr. Edwin Chan, who helped us to understand this whole um, uh, development of, of guidelines uh, process, and also the AMS, uh, the Academy support team, particularly uh, Ira, right, for, for, for being so helpful. I thought I have one minute to share with you, and I thought that uh, I just came from the Singapore Advocacy Awards. Have you heard of this? It is, it's, it's an interesting award. It's, it's an award that, um, that, that, is a, um, that was... Um, uh, proposed by civil society and they got pe private funders to fund it and they gave out awards to people and one of the awards was going to someone with a mental health illness, um, uh, um, uh, schizophrenia, and she was there to receive her award so I, I went to g give her support. So I, I feel that I should advocate as well as we are doctors and we should be advocating for change, to make things better, to improve care. So I, I just want to share this with you. I know some of the people in this room have heard me, but I keep talking about it. You know, in education, um, the concept of universal education is everyone gets education, all right? And then when there is a problem, they use a response to intervention technique, which is basically find those who have uh, additional needs and then provide additional help. In healthcare, we don't actually do that. Ours is a response to illness model, which means you go and seek the doctor when you feel not so good, when things are problematic. This results in long waiting queues. And you know, when we talk about universal health care, we are always talking about trying to make us more efficient. Your doctor must be able to see 20 patients, 30 patients, 40, maybe 50. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. This kind of universal health care will just kill us. I propose that we relook at the whole health care model, you know, that the traditional healthcare model of hospital and clinician-centric clinics is resource-intensive uh, and has accessibility issues. It, um, the traditional prevention model is, in mental health at least, can potentially cause stigma and avoidance and just not want to talk about it. The traditional health promotion model is costly because we have to go to the press, the media, and talk about the problems and get people to hear about it. When you come to a talk like this, I think that we have to f move towards educational self-care, which is start young, use technology, get the kids involved. You know, they learn so much in school. Why don't you teach them to be their own doctors? 
<laughs> in a very, uh, you know, in a more logical way. Make health education, I suppose, examinable subject. So I tell this story to education, I tell it to you too, because we need a new model, a model that is, doesn't have that stigma of identifying problems only when they are bad and identifying them early, identifying them where they are. Where are our kids today? They are in school. Where is our healthcare system for kids today? They're not in school. We need to be more in school. Maybe you should set up your clinics in school, if the schools will let us. So just to show you the hospital-centric model, when I started in child psychiatry, I, I sat in the child guidance clinic, we were ballooning in terms of numbers. And once we tell people about ADHD, we get, we get worried because we have too many patients and there's long waiting times, up to six months. Today, our waiting time in the clinic is about, about a month. Um, we created, uh, well, this is what's happening, reality. 10% will come to the specialist, 20% will be out in the um, family, medicine, primary care, and then if they can't ha you can't handle, you just send them to the, the specialist clinic. And 70% just go there in the schools and, and people try and help them. We've developed a program that tries to help them in school, with the school, with the community agency, and only get doctors involved much later. And that's called REACH. Um, I don't have time to talk very much into it, but I thought I'd just let you know. We're looking for partners, and GPs are important partners in this process, because you are part of this system. We need more of you to come on board. We're willing to help you. We have a team that comes to you. This team has been drawn, uh, um, um, rolled out for the entire country. We only have 30 GPs who are participating in the program. We need 300. Can I count on you to make this a better place for our kids? For those of you who are interested, please go to our website. This is just about what REACH, uh, a community team does. They will come to you. And I'm going to have a meeting with our team to look at some of this. Uh, those of you who are interested, please send me an email. We'll get back to you. Okay, this is just the website. Want to know more about REACH? Go to this website. It has a lot of information about ADHD as well. Okay, so hopefully, um, this is what REACH is currently doing. 372 schools in Singapore. We reach out to um, about half a million students through the school counsellors, and we've got GP partners and so forth. So I'm hoping that we can get more. Okay, so this is my little pitch, since I have you, your attention and all of you are here. Just to say, how many actually gets to the? This is our our, our model. Uh, we'd like to see um, the development of tertiary services, but more importantly, we want the community to be involved, including the family um, practitioners. And of course, I think the next phase is really about educational self-care, something that we uh, think will be very effective in improving. This is my family, so I call it the Fang Mali. <laughs> They're quite big already. <laughs> You know, taking a lot of time, but yeah. privilege of being a uh, chairman. <laughs> um, you know, I'd like to see the future where a child has access to the community at first call and then need the, com the hospital only subsequently um, and then connect it with the community. All of you are part of this. You're the primary care providers at the first line. So we all have a part to play. You know, there's a Nigerian saying, right? It takes a village to raise a child. And we're part of that village. Um, just as another pipe, <laughs> this is for IMH. We have a mental health and resilience um, uh, conference coming up in October. If you're interested, please sign up. Because again, it's a community effort. And you are part of that community. Okay, thank you. These are my kids. They've kind of grown up. So nowadays, I don't spend that much time with them. <laughs>